This is the Build Wealth Canada podcast, episode number 21. Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. Today, I have author Valerie Ryan on the show, and we're going to talk about how to avoid getting into difficult financial situations when it comes to friends and family. Now, Valerie has interviewed a ton of people who have actually gone through these types of problems in their lives for her book and is going to share with us how we can avoid some of these catastrophic financial issues that can creep up when we're dealing with friends, family, and coworkers. Valerie is also giving away two copies of her book to Build Wealth Canada listeners, where she shares these stories and lessons learned. Her book is called Gold Diggers and Deadbeat Dads. And to win, just send me a question that you'd like answered on a future episode or tell me of a guest that you'd like to have on the show and you'll automatically be entered to win the prize. All right. You can get the show notes and my contact information to enter the draw by going to buildwealthcanada.ca slash 21. So just the number 21. All right. I'll see you over there. And now let's get into the show. All right. Hey, Valerie, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, Cornell. It's great to be here. So, Valerie, uh, you have a a great book and you have a blog as well. And in it, you basically bring in individuals who've had sort of really negative experiences when they've brought in, when, when they basically mixed personal relationships with money. And sometimes these sort of incidents result in pretty sort of catastrophic financial losses for some people. Um, are there any sort of general best practices that you can share before we dive into more detail that we should basically strongly consider in our own sort of day-to-day lives to basically prevent uh, some of these common mistakes that you see people make over and over again when it comes to mixing uh, you know, personal relationships with money? Sure. I think uh, from um, the high level, you need to know that um, uh, when you mix your your personal and your financial relationships, that there's a completely different dynamic than if it was what they call an arm's length transaction, like borrowing money from a bank. And that there's a whole swirl of things going on under the surface um, that underpin your, your personal relationship, You know how you feel about this person, whether it's a sibling or a friend or a lover or a spouse. And that can tend to cloud your your judgment or lead you to go down certain paths you might not otherwise go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can see how, yeah, like you said, the, the clouding of the judgment, uh, how that's kind of the big thing, right? Because you could be a completely rational person at work, you know, you could be very diligent in everything you do. But then if it's uh, if it's like, a, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, or like a really close friend, we sort of put that on the back burner. So, or it's easy to put that on the back burner and not really realize the uh, catastrophic consequences it can actually have, right? Exactly. Yeah. So if we were to get a little bit age specific, I mean, I imagine that depending on what sort of life stage you're at, what age you're at, uh, there are certain mistakes that you're more likely to make at that particular stage. So, you know, let's say, let's start at the beginning. Let's say somebody is in their 20s or maybe early 30s. So they're sort of in that, you know, maybe the beginning stages of their career or or just kind of getting really well into their careers. You know, what are some common mistakes or or even scams that somebody sort of in that age group at that life stage should be especially careful about? Okay, well, the book shows you can make mistakes at any stage of your life. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and you're at the um, earlier stages, 20s, 30s, I think it'd be more in the lending co-signing areas mm-hmm. because maybe you're at a stage where um, you don't have so much money or the other person is kind of in between. And so it would tend to come up more likely somebody needs a loan here and there or they can't afford the um, rent on an, um, an apartment all on its own. So. Mm-hmm. Um, they want you on on the lease as well. It's interesting, though. I um, thought and still believe that the target audience for my book would be um, women 45 to 60. Mm -hmm. And um, some friends who are in their late 20s read it. And I thought they never would be interested in it. Instead, they said, you know, we are scared to death. Look at all these things that could happen to us along the way. Um, so, but you're right. Some things uh, tend to come up uh, more um, depending on the stage of life that you're at. Sure. And also, um, 
the there's a sort of premarital pre-commitment chapter and if uh, people are looking to get um, heavily involved living together getting engaged getting married yeah. uh, in that time frame um, those tips pointers and stories would uh, would resonate as well yeah yeah because like yeah definitely i definitely don't want uh, it to come off that this episode's all about sort of these negative horrible things and just to scare people and make everyone paranoid and, and anything like that. Um, I think it's like, I'm a, I'm a very positive person, but I think we should still learn from others mistakes because there are certain things that we could really easily do that can easily kind of save us a lot of grief later just by taking the right precautions now. So it's kind of, you know, let's learn from others mistakes and hopefully these things will never happen to us but it doesn't hurt to be aware of them so that we can cover our bases accordingly um, as opposed to, you know, 10 years down the road, we're horrified because our credit's been ruined because, you know, we've experienced some of these, you know, we get suckered into some scam or, or, or someone close to us took advantage of us, then we never saw it coming. So, um, right. yeah, yeah. And, and the book also, inc- it's not just doom and gloom because, you know, who wants to just read uh, right. horror stories? Um but it also has uh, preventative tips. Um, so here's not how to run to trouble. And it also has some, okay, if you've already had this this kind of problem, what you do next. So mm-hmm. it, it is sort of practical in, in that respect. It's not just uh, the train wreck stories. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so that's really good how we can read it to be, yeah, as a preventative guide, basically, is kind of where I would approach it from. But then someone that's maybe already experienced some of these situations and aren't sure how to deal with it, um, then it, you're saying it, the book can be good for them as well because it does also go into different ways that they could overcome these issues. Exactly. Right? Okay, great. Um, can you share us, maybe, uh, maybe share with us one of the stories that you encountered of somebody that say that is in their 20s um, where maybe they got taken advantage of or, or, um, or something didn't quite work out the way they wanted it to and kind of what they could have done to prevent it. Maybe, you know, something we can all learn from a little bit. Sure. Uh, there were a couple in the book, so it's, it's hard to pick which one. Uh, I think there was um, one uh, where a woman uh, was involved uh, with a coworker. She actually wasn't um, in an intimate relationship. It really was, was just a friendship, but could happen just as easily, uh, um, obviously, in a boyfriend-girlfriend type um, uh, type situation where he would ask to borrow uh, money because he was a little short uh, before payday and it was no big deal. It was twenty dollars here, fifteen there. I mean, I think we've all been in that situation where uh, where we're a bit short and it it turned into a pattern with large and larger amounts um, and it led all the way up to um, uh, hey, I need a I can't get a cell phone. Can you put mine on your account? Which should have been a red flag if, if somebody can't get a cell phone. Right. Maybe they're not in the best financial shape. Um, so she just uh, went ahead to uh, sort of keep the peace, um, uh, peace her friend. She also was, um, I don't know if she was his supervisor, but she was definitely in a, in a supervisory role. So um, I, I think she wasn't used to sort of that dynamic and she just kind of wanted to uh, um, be, be the good boss or the friendly supervisor. Oh, okay. So she... She went ahead and put um, his cell phone on, on her account, and um, he ran up all kinds of data charges, um, just totally blew it out of the water, said he'd pay her back, didn't pay her back, uh, wrecked her credit. She had to give up the phone, um, hmm. and it went on. It even went on from there. He uh, wanted to rent a car, and she put it on her account, and you know he drove off, and it, you know it just kind of kept going mm-hmm. on and on. And, um, it, it's easy, of course, for us to say, well, if she'd seen the warning signs of the first place, um, the, the borrowing the money, uh, I think he paid her back with a, with a starter check out of a new account and the check bounced. Um, so maybe if she had caught the early warning signs, she wouldn't have ended up losing her phone, her credit and, and lots of money. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. And I can see how being a, a supervisor can really complicate matters a little bit too, right? Cause you're supposed to be this sort of supportive figure as well right uh and so, exactly. so you're kind of feeling that pressure to okay i want to make sure that well i don't know if, if, if she was you said like you're not sure if she was his supervisor or not but let's say she was i mean i can see that being uh, you know pretty difficult right because you want them to succeed you feel, you know you want them to be happy you want their morale to be up 
you, you know you want everything to be good with your with your fellow employees especially the ones reporting to you right uh to keep the group the group dynamics positive because it can really affect the work uh and so yeah so it can be really easy to just say sure it's no big deal it's not you know and then you're opening up yourself to all these uh, possible difficulties down the road all right and she did find out later that he had been hitting up other co-workers oh, and people wow. for money also wow. so it wow. definitely was a pattern Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, now, what about somebody that's maybe a little bit older, maybe let's say middle age. So, so maybe someone that already, let's say, has children. They've been in their careers for a while. They have a mortgage. They're probably making you know, a bit more money now than they or possibly a lot more money than they were when they first you know, graduated, let's say. Um, so I think I would imagine at that stage, they're more uh, susceptible to things like different investment scams and like larger loan amounts, I would think as well. Um, are there any sort of particular challenges or things that somebody in that life stage should be careful about? Uh, well, I think at that life stage, a lot of what you're running into is divorce and second or third marriages. Oh, okay. Um, so, so not even just at the um, the stage where people have been married over a period of time, but when you start mixing and, and matching people's finances, then you've uncovered, you know, a, a whole other oh, world okay. of, um, uh, of possible complications because people bring to a relationship, um, their, their past, uh, baggage, which is assets as well as debts and their mm -hmm. way of, um, dealing with their finances. So, um, when you start out in your, in your twenties, uh, maybe you start out kind of more on e equal footing. Um, let's say you both have nothing but student debt. A uh, few few years down the track, um, and things are quite a bit more more complicated and require you to to take a closer look of, of what you're getting into. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So I can yeah, see well, a common mistake yeah. being that you know when you're younger, it's 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 a bit easier, right? Because it could just be a coworker asking you to borrow fifty bucks or a hundred bucks or you know, a couple hundred bucks, you know, you, you kind of get more into those situations. Whereas as you get older, you've both been now accumulating assets for, uh, you know, for quite some time, uh, you know, it could be, you know, 10 years now, let's say that you've been accumulating assets for, uh, or, or debt, right? It could go either way. Uh, and so it's a bit more uh, complicated and the stakes are a lot higher. So I guess a good tip there I would think would be to, uh, to realize that the stakes have now gotten higher. And so you can just kind of approach it with as casual of and it's, it's such a casual way that you might have when you were younger, when it's like, oh, it's 50 bucks, he's my best friend, whatever, as opposed to, okay, well, now we're talking about really large sums of money. Uh, I have to make sure I do due diligence and, and cover my bases very thoroughly. All right. Would you agree? Oh, yes. In fact, jumping back to your original <laughs> question, which I sort of <laughs> jumped over, um, excuse me, in my rush to get to the... Uh, later marriage scenario. I mean, with, within a marriage, it's, it's extremely common, um, the surveys show of people to, to lie about um, debts that they're either racking up right within the marriage and, and managing to hide them or assets that they're um, sort of squirreling off somewhere else. And this is, can be a, a huge uh, problem in marriage, no matter whether you're uh, recently married, married a long time, second, second marriage, um, people for whatever reason or reasons um, have secrets and lies. And a lot of times it, it revolves around money. Now, when there are hidden things like that, let's say, you know, someone's about to get married, they're engaged. The one person that has a ridiculous amount of debt, uh, you know, really bad debt, high interest debt, high amount, they don't tell the other person. Do you think that that's a lot of times just... It, that that's intentional that they don't want to tell this person they just because they're like they're just not good people let's say or do you think it's just you know what they're maybe just embarrassed about it and they don't really you know they want to fix that but they don't want to talk about it to this person until it kind of it gets fixed because it's something that they're all probably not very proud of either do you think that's usually the yeah, case? yeah i think so um i don't think it's mm -hmm. necessarily you know bad people i think that's probably the minority but i mean face it yeah. um everybody's made some some bad financial decisions i mean everybody i mean i think every one of your listeners can look back and say well i really i shouldn't have done that i shouldn't have bought that i shouldn't have racked up that uh, amount of debt maybe i shouldn't mm -hmm. have bought that expensive car and it's okay i mean we've all made mistakes uh, you learn from them hopefully mm -hmm. you don't make them a second time and 
and you move on. So I don't think you got, while I think you need to get um, the total accurate view of what your um, partner to be has done in the past financially and the position they're in now. Um, I don't think a, a misstep or two or three or a big one or whatever is a reason to completely cross them off your list. What's important is mm -hmm. what you do about it from now going forward. So if somebody has mm -hmm. a lot of debt, um, you don't necessarily write them off. You sit with that person and say, okay, so you, you have this debt. How did it? How did it happen in the first place? And how are you know we the we going to um, deal with it going forward? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I mean the reason I brought up that question is because when I when I hear stories like oh well my husband you know my fiance turned out that she had massive amounts of debt we got married and I got stuck with all that debt you know when I hear things like that I I don't think uh, you know I, I right away I you kind of I think naturally we hear when we hear that we think you know what that's not me. All right. Because I love my fiance, you know, she or he is, you know, they're, they're great. They're amazing people. They would never do that to me, period. Um, and so I think, so I, like by, by default, I think we kind of maybe dismiss that that could happen to us. But then I think well, you brought up an interest, you know, when we talk about this, it, it seems like, well, you know what, it, it could still happen to you, not because they're bad people or because they're trying to scheme or anything. It's just, it, it could have been a mistake that they're embarrassed to bring up. And so they're just kind of maybe ashamed of it. And, and that's why they're not, you know, they're not, you know, you're not, they're not just openly talking to you about it. Right. Um, because they don't want you to maybe judge them or, or, or maybe they're just afraid of how you'll react. Right. So I think, I think that could be a big sort of thing where it could really happen to anyone. Uh, they're still wonderful people. It's just, you know, they just need some help maybe in that department. Right. Everybody has a financial skeleton in the closet. <laughs> Not everyone. I don't have any financial <laughs> Not skeleton. Not one. You've never closet. made a purchase you regret. Or... Oh, oh, yeah. like, uh, well, yeah, I, I bought a house too uh, when I was young. Like, we, we should have rented first, whereas we, we kind of went out and bought a house right away. Like, that was kind of my, uh, I guess, financial skeleton, right? But it's, I, I, I guess it when I think of financial it skeleton... It wasn't yeah. hidden. Yeah. Like it was just like, I guess it was more, it was an optimum, yeah. <laughs> right. As opposed to like, it's cause when I think of skeleton, I think of like, Oh, I racked up $10,000 in credit card debt and I'm not telling yeah. anyone. I don't know. That's, that's my definition of a financial skeleton, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but for sure. Yeah. We've all made mistakes. Like, uh, you know, when it comes to ways we could have, sometimes maybe they're really bad, like huge credit card debt. And sometimes they could be something like, made an unoptimal investment or, you know, or something like that. Or robbed um, a bank. So. <laughs> or robbed a bank. Then there's, yeah, there's also that extreme. <laughs> Just casually robbed the bank. One Didn't day, get you know? caught, so it doesn't show up on the credit report. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> so uh, for somebody in that sort of age group, can you maybe share a story with us? Uh, maybe where that's happened to somebody in, in some of your research? Sure. Um, and uh, you call it research. Um, I Or interviews, it, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it is yeah. research, but I mean, the people that I spoke with, um, you know, I met with personally or on the phone and, and, and got their whole story. So in, in a sense, it's research. And in a sense, it's uh, just hanging out and, and talking with people. But it was for the, the purpose of the book and the blog. Mm -hmm. um, so there was... Let's see, there was one story where they were engaged um, and the fiance uh, moved in and didn't disclose that she had all this debt. I think, I think, I think Hal is his name in the book. I don't know because I always change all the names. So, uh, so I don't always mm -hmm. remember them. It was Hal right. was, was um, the guy living in the house and um, fiance moved in and she didn't. Uh, tell him about the debt that um, that she had um, and he started noticing that the bills were coming in uh, because she changed her dress to his and oh, okay. she wasn't sort of opening them or paying attention to them or having any kind of what looked like an organized system of um, of paying them and um, mm -hmm. long story short they heard a, um, a loud knock at uh, their door one morning and they both got very uh, worried because uh, at, at this point he knew uh, he, he had asked to see a copy of her credit report and found uh, there was all kinds of, of bad stuff. And so 
Mm -hmm. um, they thought it was the sheriff or somebody coming to serve a summons on her for um, um, uh, a default judgment. And um, mm -hmm. it turned out it wasn't, it wasn't anybody serving a summons. It was the plumber or the electrician or, or somebody. But it was kind of at that moment he, he realized that he – uh, living your life in fear of somebody knocking on the right. door was uh, yeah. not yeah. the way to be. And so that was a, a wake up call uh, for him. And uh, he loved his fiance, but realized he didn't want to spend his life being afraid of people knocking on the front door. So yeah. that was, that was the end of that. I, yeah. I could see that being a big, uh, a big moment, right? When you realize, wait a minute, I shouldn't be afraid. Yeah. <laughs> of hearing a door knock that's yeah. <laughs> something's something's wrong in this in this situation right. we've got to work on that yeah yeah that's interesting um so let's maybe talk about sort of that last um kind of life stage so let's say somebody is getting close to retirement or maybe is already retired or maybe you know it's, it's someone younger but they have elderly parents uh, and i mean we hear kind of these stories sometimes of elderly individuals getting tricked and scammed um, as well. Um, are, are there any sort of things that somebody in that age group should be especially careful about? Sure. Well, one is that uh, we all should do um, earlier in life as well as to get your will, your trust, your, um, your um, advanced directives, your powers of attorney, your medical powers of attorney, get, um, get all that set up. And nobody likes to do that. Nobody likes to think about mm -hmm. that. We don't like to confront the thought of our own death is just um, right. it's taboo in our society. It's uncomfortable. It brings up all these um, feelings that we have about money and our, our personal relationships. Who's going to get your stuff? Um, have you had this feud with a sibling? Are you going to, you know, punish them by not, uh, uh, not, you know, quote, rewarding them. So, um, but not having that stuff in place can cause you know, unbelievable problems and anguish. Um, if something does happen to you, um, either you die or, um, you know, you have some kind of horrible um, accident or situation where you end up in a coma. And if nobody knows what you wanted, I mean, you can leave right. a world of, of hurt behind. Uh, so that's something mm -hmm. to think about earlier rather than later. I know a lot of people... Um, earlier think, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm young, this isn't an issue for me, and I'm married and I have kids, so it's it's all very easy, it'll go to them, and uh, it's not quite mm -hmm. so true. I mean, the laws of each state are different, and um, if you uh, die with without a will, I mean, you're just causing even more of a, a world of hurt, because uh, whoever ends up being your executor has to go through um, all kinds of paperwork and cost and time and, and bother that uh, you wouldn't wish on uh, you wouldn't wish on anybody mm -hmm. so that's uh, partly how it can turn out um, where uh, you're talking about cautioning people as they're getting older um, if people don't have um, those kinds of things set up sometimes you'll see that other members of the family or um, so-called friends or new friends are trying to influence an older person into writing them into their will, giving them power of attorney. Um, right, and it's just right. absolutely tragic uh, when this happens. And there was um, a story in the book along along those lines where a, a sister had sort of honed her, her way in, horned her way into um, um, their, uh, their mother's life uh, at a time when the mother uh, probably um, had, uh, I think she had early uh, Alzheimer's, or it wasn't quite mm -hmm. so early. Um, and um, uh, I think things turned out uh, other than how uh, the mother would have wanted them to. And it's just yeah. tragic because uh, it was, in a lot of sense, already already too late. And uh, you're yeah. at a point where who could say what uh, what the mother wanted? Maybe she did favor the daughter and wanted her to have power of attorney. Um, or mm -hmm. at the other end of the spectrum, no, she wouldn't have wanted that at all. But the point is nobody knows because there was no will, there was no power of attorney right. and caused a, a world of hurt in that family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. Uh, that actually has yeah, something similar uh, like that happened to actually to, to our family um, as well. And yeah, it, it's one of those things where you think it would never kind of happen, but, but yeah, it can get really uh, difficult, right? Because if, if they don't have that set up 
and then you know one person might say oh they want things this way and then the other person says well no they weren't in the right fine in, in the right mental state when they made that decision because they've all had alzheimer's for the past x number of years right and so now you, it opens up the door for all this sort of arguing and and it really kills the family relationships a lot too right when all of a sudden now you've got you know siblings fighting over things and um you know one person saying well you know she wanted it this way and the other one saying well no you coerced her into doing that or you know things like that or she wasn't in the right state of mind she was already you know mentally sick by the time she made that decision so that's not valid and it's yeah it's a really tough spot um like in my extended family that something like this happened and yeah it's it was pretty pretty rough right and now they don't even speak to each other right so uh definitely something you want to <laughs> yeah for sure solve beforehand get get an order beforehand so that you don't um so that you're not the cause of something must happen to you of all this sort of family all these family issues um and yeah and speaking to your first point you made about how this isn't just something if you're older or if you have older parents um i know when my wife and i we had all this these things kind of settled um you know uh, quite a while back actually um and it was yeah and it was very interesting to have those conversations with my wife because you start talking about things like it was really you know odd kind of right because oh well what if i died and what if i'm in a coma you know uh, there's that whole like do not resuscitate thing that we see on tv all the time right well that's on tv but in real life you actually have to start talking about that and how, how do how do i want people to deal you know depending if i'm in a coma versus not versus like all these sort of things that are really tough and you kind of spook to talk about but then imagine leaving that responsibility to someone um, you know, if you haven't made it clear what you want, I mean, that can be very stressful and cause a lot of um, anger within the family because someone might have different opinions or views. Uh, yeah, like so I definitely couldn't agree more that it's better to get this taken care of way, way beforehand because who knows, right? You may be in, even you might be 24 and you get in a car accident tomorrow and now you're in a coma and now what? Right. right? So and yeah, the, yeah. So that, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the coma situation, it's not black and white either. Um, because you'll find that the doctors won't necessarily agree. Yes, this person will wake up. Yes, this person will wake up, but they'll be, um, you know, there'll be such incredible brain damage that, um, right. um, you know, their their life won't be, they'll really lose the quality of life. Well, they'll wake up, um, but their um, their mental and physical um, abilities will, will be severely compromised. Well, they'll be only partially compromised. Um, oh, they'll never right. wake up. And the doctors can't agree, and and um, that puts, as you're saying, that puts the people um, sort of left behind who are making the decision um, in a very yeah. hard place because it's not like it's just a yes or a no that they have to um, uh, decide on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I remember for us it was well, if we are on life support, how long? Right. I mean, what what's that? You know, is it? Um, is it is there a specific time like is it 10 years is it forever is it a month like how you know those things or are there different variables that would affect that right like you said like you know are they going to be brain dead if they come out of it are they going to be fully functional are they going to be partially there's all these sort of different variations that you have to talk about which obviously it's really easy to procrastinate and not do that right. <laughs> because it's difficult right but it's it's pretty it's uh, it's definitely pretty important. So you know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that well, up. Well, Cornell, it sounds like you have a story, and I am writing a sequel. So if <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to be part of my research pool for the next one, um, <laughs> seriously, I change names and um, you know situations and all, but it just it goes to show that um, in the in the book, there's kind of something for for everyone if you really stop and think about it, um, from from the lending so, money to the um, uh, person, uh, you know, dear one being in a, in a coma or having dementia and not being able to express themselves. Yeah. 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 No, for, for sure. If, um, yeah, I'll definitely be up for that. If, uh, you know, if you're writing a sequel and you want something, yeah, we de definitely learned, like, like I said, it didn't happen to me, uh, directly. It's not like, you know, what happened to, you know, my, my, my brother or anything, but it did happen to somebody within, my family let's just i guess we let's, let's just say that <laughs> so 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 I, I definitely got to uh experience as a third kind of kind of like a third party uh from the sidelines seeing kind of all the drama and difficulties and stress and money that kind of went through that and and the relationships ruined and it's it's pretty sad because you know like you could see siblings uh 
you know, so like, I mean, like I have a good relationship with my brother and I, I mean, imagine like that getting torn apart because of something like that. Like it would just be horrible. So for sure, like you want to make sure that you don't let it ever fall in that situation. And, and I think too, like an interesting point is that, um, like we t were talking about how difficult it would be for a person to decide what to do with you. If let's say you were in a coma and, and, and if you think about it from their perspective, I mean, they're already stressed out, right? I mean, at that point, they don't know if you're going to live. They, they're just, they're, they're obviously you're, you're dear to them. So they're already, you know, in, in really bad emotional shape right now, because they're trying to process what just happened to you. So when they're in that state, do you really want to say, oh, by the way, now you should decide what I would want to be done with me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like now that you're in like the worst shape of your life, uh, you know, mentally, probably, I want you to make this crazy important decision. And I trust you'll make the right decision. I mean, that's, that's a lot to ask of someone like I would never wish that on on someone that's close to me, right? Uh, that, and then the rest of their life, they could be wondering like, oh, did I make the right decision? Maybe they wanted something different, right? And that could really, like I could see that really tearing someone up inside if they're, you know, if, if let's say, you know, they, they they made a certain decision and, and now they might be regretting it for the rest of their life. Like, I mean, that would be oh, horrible. I can't so, imagine. But it does, it does yeah. force you into having the conversations now with, um, as you yeah, said, your, yeah. your wife and family. So you can say, Look what happened there. If the situation in my case were the same, here is what I want you to do. And if something like that happened, mm -hmm. it's not going to be the identical situation, but at least they have some idea of your 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 spiritual or your religious or your practical or your financial, just right. where you stand somewhere on the spectrum if something like that happened. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like you said, it may be hard to cover every single angle, but at least you'll give them something where they can make an educated decision and not fear for the rest of their lives that they made the wrong one and now they're living in regret. I mean, that's, that'd be a horrible way to, to put that on someone that you care of about or, or to put on anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, all right. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta turn this positive stuff on because we're talking about these worst case <laughs> scenarios now. <laughs> I do inject a bit of, uh, of humor into the book. It's just sort of my own, uh, own brand of humor. Uh, uh, yeah, just, that's good. We need some comic yeah, relief when we oh, talk about is. subjects yeah. like this. Yeah, we're talking about comas yeah. and these depressing things. There is, there is yeah. a lighter side in there. Yeah, yeah. Whew. All right, all right. I gotta try to. So, um, <laughs> my so my next question won't be as uh, won't be as doom and gloom. Um, so let's say that, um, and then, so the next one questions I have are kind of how to deal if you're put into certain situations. So for example, let's say that, you know, um, you're, you're with someone that maybe a good friend or, or family member, and they ask you to co-sign something. So, uh, you know, whether it's for a mortgage or for a car loan or something like that, how would you recommend dealing with that? Um, what are the implications? And let's say that and kind of the big one too is, Let's say I don't want to, so you know, you don't want to lend that person, uh, or, or you don't want to co-sign for that. Well, how do you talk to them about it so that it doesn't hurt the relationship and it doesn't make the relationship awkward? Because that's such a delicate conversation to have, right? Yeah, you're right. That's um, that is a hard one, whether it's a, a friend or a family member, because um, there would be a certain amount of. Um, uh, pressure involved, right? Because they they right. want something um, for whatever reason, whether it's a car or business loan, uh, whatever it is. And presumably, this is somebody you uh, you like, you love, you want to help out. But in the you know, the devil on your shoulder is saying, oh, "This is this is not going to end well." Because um, you have to mm -hmm. start with the basic um, uh, basic premise that this person needs a co-signer because the bank has said no, um, we don't trust her alone to pay it back. And, and the bank is right. uh, completely um, third party, doesn't know this person, doesn't care if they're a nice person. They've just crunched the numbers and said, okay, based on her um, credit history, her age, what she wants the loan for, uh, not a good risk. Um, now, mm -hmm. the numbers aren't always exactly right. I mean, because they're taking it uh, as a percentage of risk, okay, 90% says she's going to default on it. Well, she could be the 10%, right? Um, so the bank has made its decision. It wants somebody else on the hook. Um, and so she turns uh, to you. 
And so the first mm -hmm. thing you have to understand is if she does default or gets behind, it's just as much your responsibility as, as hers. And it's one thing people don't always understand. They think, oh, it's just a formality. It's just um, it's just my my name to get notices. No, the bank is going to see you as equally um, liable for uh, that loan, uh, no matter what sort mm -hmm. of private arrangement you had between the two of you or what your um, what your understanding was. And in terms of um, how you approach that, yeah, that that is difficult. And one thing you can do is, I think, instead of just saying no, if you come to the decision, this is not a risk you want to take. Um, because, by the way, it also affects your, your own credit. Even if this person, even if she pays on time every time, um, it's, in, um, it's a debt on your um, credit report. So it might keep you from perhaps getting oh, credit on your own. If there's point. this 20 or 30 or whatever thousand dollars it is, it lowers right. your ability to say go out and get a mortgage. But uh, what you could, That's a yeah, but what you could do is suggest um, alternatives. Um, have they tried other ways to get this this money, depending on what it's for? Um, have they, if they owe uh, money to somebody else or something else or a doctor or whatever, have they tried uh, um, bargaining, negotiating for a lower, <clears throat> excuse me, a lower amount, <clears throat> excuse me again, to be due in the first place? Because you, you just sort of assume that you start out with this amount you owe. Have you tried asking for that debt to be reduced? And there's kind of a whole lot of other things that go along with that that could have tax implications, but just start out with that. Yeah, all right, so we're back on. Uh, we just had, a, had to do a quick little water break. And uh, yeah, we're, we're good to go. Go Great. ahead, Valerie. So one thing you can do is ask if the person has tried negotiating for a lower amount that they owe. Um, uh, do they owe a, a doctor or a... Um, whoever it is that they owe, um, that's kind of step one is instead of just assuming the amount that they owe that they need a co-signature on, um, can they argue for a smaller amount? Or maybe they don't need as much as they think they need if they're getting a business loan. Can they mm -hmm. um, make it a, a smaller amount? Um, mm -hmm. Also, um, crowdfunding is now um, a new option um, that's become popular in the last few years where right. um, you ask friends, family, strangers to help fund your, your, your project or, or your debt, whatever it is. Um, there's also peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, there's, so there's all kinds of other options you can put to them and say, have you considered trying this instead of or along with um, co-signing a smaller mm -hmm. loan? So that way you're not just saying no. Um, I mean, they might still get annoyed that they came to you and they wanted this and you didn't say yes, but right, right. And now you're making it more difficult. Yeah. Oh, no, no, I have to... <laughs> you're supposed to be a friend. Right, you're not, you're not supposed to make it. Do a Kickstarter camp. <laughs> now I have to go research <laughs> yeah. places. Now I yeah. got to go ask other people. Thanks. A lot. But, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you got to look, um, look on your, look out for your, yourself as well as trying to help your friend, family mm -hmm. member. Yeah. That, that's a great tip. Yeah. So, cause I can see that being, a reasonable thing if, if they if someone asks you for that to call let's say co-sign something and you say look like first off like let's look at these other options because doing this is really going to stress me out uh you could you, you could say that because now i'm responsible for that and it's something i don't have any control over uh like once it goes into place um uh, so that that's going to stress me out and two there are all these other options that i'd rather like you go first before we consider this route and then you can mention all those suggestions like like you just said like the you know like the crowdfunding the peer-to-peer -peer lending that kind of stuff um and then i guess the third thing is you can say like you mentioned about how look this is actually going to go on my uh credit uh, as report as well and so this could impact my ability to borrow money as well so for example we want to buy a house soon or something like that that might actually hurt it and so I don't, you know, so I, I wouldn't want to expose myself to that situation when you could easily go and, and, and get money from these other sources where there wouldn't be any negative impact on both of us. So I think if you approach it that way, it sounds a lot more reasonable. Like they're still not going to be as happy as if you just said yes right away. No questions asked. But I mean, but I think those are those are some really that kind of gives you ammunition to give them a response that is reasonable and still helpful to them 
without just a flat out rejection right. you know yeah yeah so i think that could be a good way to do it if you don't want to like if you want to do it gently and don't want to hurt the relationship and if they're really good friends of yours anyway they shouldn't write you off now because you said no i mean you know they should consider it from your angle too right if they care about you then <laughs> it, it shouldn't be like well if you're my friend you should lend me this and if you're not then clearly clearly you're not yeah. right uh, then, then that that's kind of a flag that maybe they're not as good of friends as you as you thought that's it exactly right um, in fact i just um someone just shared with me their story along those lines i won't go into all the detail it'll be in in the sequel and, and on the blog pretty soon but uh it was family members uh um wanted uh um wanted a um wasn't a co-signing um but uh, the, the exact particulars don't don't really matter, but the the, the bottom line was when um, the couple didn't go along with whatever it was, the um, the brother and sister in law just threw up their hands and said, you know, we're done with you, and it and they had mm -hmm. been very close previously. It wasn't sort of going to a, a distant mm -hmm. relative or. A, um, um, they, I right. mean, they considered them friends as well as relatives. The four of them did things, um, you know, uh, vacations and, and what all together and really got along quite well. And, um, the couple who were approached, um, and who really wrestled with, um, whether to go ahead with it or not, and eventually decided, no, they were just, um, just amazed when the brother and sister-in-law said, um, well, you know, we're done. We're no longer family. It was the last thing they expected. Right. And I think knowing that they wouldn't have made a different decision, but um, um, that was uh, that was real tragic for them um, to, mm -hmm. to lose, uh, knowing they made the right decision financially and, and for themselves, um, but but seeing what it did to the, the relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know, with relationships, I mean, if a relationship is that fragile to begin with, where you saying no to a big, big favor like that instantly makes that person not want to have anything to do with you ever. I mean, that that's a pretty fragile relationship. And that's kind of I think to me, that would be a sign that uh, how close of a relationship do I even want to have with that person? Because, I mean, it, it, it just it doesn't seem like. Like I mean, I mean, I think if you're a genuinely a true friend, then you're a lot more understanding, and you know you you can kind of you can be more understanding of, of, of if if you say no, right? Versus if it's like a take it or leave it approach. I mean, that's I don't know. To me, that's just not a sign of a good friendship, right? Because friends are supposed to help each other out and look for each other's uh, interests as well, not just their own. Well, the, the brother and sister in law were in a desperate situation, and I, I'm not excusing. Uh, what they did or, or what they were asking for, but um, financial desperation makes us do uh, uh, mm. makes us do certain things. So I think um, while they really did have that close relationship, um, they were mm. kind of, I mean, by their own doing, really, they were forced into this situation and uh, their reaction um, completely unexpected, but um, it just shows the um, right. the whole the whole pressure of the situation and as i said it was uh uh extremely yeah. uh extremely unfortunate that it just yeah. you know rip, yeah. ripped that yeah. family apart that, that that's a good point yeah because it they might have just been acting out of emotion because they're already stressed out it's it's it is an emotional situation and so they, they you know they got mad because the person wouldn't lend them the money but it was just maybe that, you know, they just got to, they just got emotional over it. And that's, you know, whereas if they weren't in an emotional state, they would have been a bit more reasonable. So that's a good point because some people do get uh, emotional and they can make certain decisions that they regret later, like, you know, cutting someone off completely, you know, for no, for not really a, a good enough reason. Essentially. Right. And this, so this, uh, it was somebody who reached out to me recently and, um, mm -hmm. she said, I, I feel like, um, I feel like there's been a death. I lost this, um, you know, wow. I lost this friendship. I lost these relatives, but, um, this was quite mm -hmm. recently. Um, so who's to say maybe over time it'll be mended yeah. or, or maybe not, maybe it's destroyed forever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, hopefully in those situations, you know, once sort of the dust settles and the emotions get a bit calmed down, I, I would hope that that person gets a bit more, uh, hopefully gets more reasonable and you can try to rekindle that relationship a little bit more. But I, I, yeah, maybe just some time has to pass before 
sort of the, the dust kind of settles a little bit before you can start uh, rebuilding that relationship, basically. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. I think she had, I think it had happened and she somehow found uh, my book or the blog. And by the time she wrote me, it had only been six weeks since it had all blown up. Oh, okay. So it, the wound was was quite uh, gaping open. And um, yeah, I'll yeah. keep in touch with her and you know, hope things uh, improve in the family. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure, because I'm sure we all know people that I mean, we all know people that are h highly emotional um, and or you know, it's easy for them to get in this really high emotional state. And then there's others who are uh, a bit more robotic, I guess you could call it like like me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so for those that are a bit more uh, on the kind of emotional side, uh, I mean, you know, I, I've you know, I, I know quite a few people that are, that are like that, too. And then, yeah, I can see how they can really get upset over something very quickly. Um, but I. I, I guess I kind of hope that down the road, the dust, they, they calm down, the dust settles and they're able to start kind of rebuilding and they, they see kind of, they, they may not ever say they were wrong or anything like that, but, but at least they become more open to the kind of let bygones be bygones basically. Right. Because now they're, they've had time to calm down. They've had time to deal with the situation. Like you said, the wound isn't as fresh at that point either. Right. So it's okay. So, but I, I really, oh, sorry, right, go so, ahead. So you were uh, acting robotic when you realized you'd bought more house than you could afford. <laughs> <laughs> oh no no, I never I never bought more more house than I could afford. Yeah, I just I, I just should have I should have yeah. rent yeah, like my my issue like you know we bought a house and it was it was fine, like it was very reasonable. Our, our uh the thing is is that we ended up moving after a year um because for a bunch of reasons like we we, we found out that we actually liked our hometown better we wanted to live there our family or was there our friends are there so that was kind of the whole reasoning for that and obviously you're not supposed to buy a house and only live there for a year because the transaction costs are too high you end up losing money so if you're if you're only going to be renting obviously our intention was to live there for a long time but that never ended up happening right and if we rented first we would have learned that very quickly within the year that we don't want to be there right but instead we bought a house right away so instead of sampling that area we dove right in right which is something that i never recommend that i recommend that people never do like you want to sample the area first rent check it out then decide if you want to buy a house in that in that city or that neighborhood or whatever okay. um, but anyways it's kind of i, I digress but that was well, kind I of digress. The, that was my <laughs> i wasn't trying <laughs> that... to point the picture the, the point the finger at you and say well you know you made bad bad emotional decisions too <laughs> so forgive me yeah, if it was... i overstep <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay it's okay no it wasn't it wasn't an emotional decision it was it was uh it was a it was a factual one and i i didn't consider all the I mean, I was young back then too, right? So I kind of had that mentality of, oh, well, you know, the renting is just putting money down the drain, right. right? It's a waste. It's never a good idea. Buy a house right away if you can afford it. So that, and that's kind of, you know, there's a few reasons I had thought like that as a kid or, or like, not a kid, but like a recent grad. Um, but, you know, now that I'm kind of older and know more things, it's, uh, you kind of realize the, that you actually did make a mistake, right? Um, as opposed to following that conventional wisdom about how you should always buy a house because renting is a waste of money. That, that's not necessarily always the answer. So um, anyways, all right. <laughs> so enough digressing, but I, I really like how, okay, when you go into these difficult conversations with family or friends where let's say you decide you don't feel comfortable, you don't want to lend them the money or you don't want to co-sign or whatever, a way to to get uh, to do that is you can try helping them get the money through other ways. So maybe you, like you said, you can make all those suggestions like crowdfunding. I really like that, you know, like different kind of ideas. And even if you really want to, you can even help them get those right or do some research with them just to give them a hand so that they're not feeling like you're just flat out rejecting them, right? Like you're still helping them out. Um, so I can see that being good. Um, and then, yeah, like if you're, if you're getting, if you're trying to get your credit to be perfect because you're about to renew your mortgage or you're getting a mortgage for the first time or, or something like that. I mean, to me, that's a really good reason, right? If like, like you don't want to co-sign on someone else's mortgage when you're going to go get your forced mortgage in the next six months or something, right? Like that's, that's just not a good, that's just not a good idea. Cause like you said, that's going to impact maybe how much money they can, they can lend you, you know, or your rate or, or whatever. So, um, so I think that's a really good reason as well. Right. Yeah, I'm really glad. I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, and you had an interesting thing on your on your blog as well. Uh, you talked about the algorithms that the banks use to figure out 
whether someone is a safe risk or not when it comes to lending money and then you know co-signing and all that kind of stuff uh, and it's interesting because i remember you mentioning how okay when you this if a bank says no well they have these algorithms and all this statistical data to know whether the person how likely the person is to default on the loan and when you're saying i'm going to co-sign that for example or i'm going to lend the money even though the bank will lend you money then you're kind of saying well i know better than the bank in terms of how risky this person is and you know what maybe you do know a bit better because like an argument could be made that you do know a bit better because maybe you've known the person your whole life right uh, and, and maybe that's a bit different but but it but it's it's a kind of a big flag right where okay these banks spend you know what millions and millions of dollars on this kind of analysis to make sure that you know they have a good system in place to be able to spot people that that are not a good risk that are not that are a credit risk and you're saying forget that system i don't care i'm gonna lend you the money anyway i mean that's kind of a scary thing to do right so i think that's a good question to ask yourself is am i better than these algorithms are you sure <laughs> how well do i really know this person right. right if you've known them for two months then i'm pretty sure the algorithm is better <laughs> right. right so anyways that's um that was kind of my take on it um uh, so yeah so the things you said about co-signing i guess a lot of them can be applied to uh, to loans as well just just general if someone asks you for a loan these are the same sort of advice that you can give them um are there anything else like some some differences if, if someone asks you to borrow money um if, if you can lend them money is there anything that you would recommend in that particular situation tell them to ask someone else <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i know you I, I, in your on your blog you mentioned um, you mentioned collateral which i thought was interesting i haven't heard that before about because banks like to have collateral but when we talk about you know like you pretty much have to to put it up if you're uh, like you know like if you're, you have a home equity line of credit you're putting up your home for as collateral basically right but we never really th- at least i i don't think people generally think too much about collateral when it comes to lending money to a friend or a coworker or, or, or whatever. Uh, can you maybe talk about kind of what your take is on the whole, like, I guess what it is and, and your take on collateral when it comes to lending money? Sure. Um, well, collateral means um, not only do I loan you the money, but you give me something that um, you're not going to want to lose if you don't pay me back. And sort of the easiest example of that is um, a car loan. The bank is going to give you the money to buy this car, but if you don't pay it back, what do they get? They get the car. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a personal situation, um, you can uh, say, okay, is there something of value that that you can you know, sort of give me to hold on to that in case you, you don't pay me back, I can keep this? And obviously, it's going to be a real uh, personal kind of um, a situation, what sort of thing, or it's not even necessarily a thing, but an arrangement. Let's say they're starting a new business. Okay, mm-hmm. maybe um, you're going to want um, to uh, own part of that business um, in return for giving them the loan. Now, of course, if the business fails, never gets off the ground, you know, the collateral that you've got isn't, you know, isn't worth anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just something that would give the the borrower sort of pause if they were going to default and just run off and, and never pay you. Um, the example in in the book was um, a guy um, uh, loaned a coworker an amount of money, and the coworker said, "Oh, well, I have this uh, the, these diamond earrings. I just happen to mm-hmm. to have. <laughs> Why don't you keep the earrings? And so, in, in case I don't pay you back." And at the time, the the guy borrowing thought, "Oh, uh, of course I'll pay him back. I'll get these earrings back and give them to my girlfriend." And the uh, the lender thought, "Well, okay, if if." Um, uh, if it all goes bad, I have these these diamond earrings, and sort of you can probably guess how it went that um, the loan didn't get paid back, and um, the guy was left with these pair of uh, diamond earrings, and he had been uh, sort of had them squirreled away and had been telling his wife for many years kind of the story, but she had never seen the earrings, and then uh, uh, when he finally brought them them out, they were you know really 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 small. I think they were real or maybe they weren't real but they were really teensy tiny and the way he'd been telling the story oh, okay, yeah. to his wife you know without looking at them over time they'd sort of gotten bigger and bigger so uh um i'm sure the 
the value of the earrings was, you know, a, a fraction of the amount that, that he had loaned. But, um, and, you know, it sort of didn't work out that the, the, the co-worker didn't make him any more uh, likely to repay the loan, but it, it's at least something to consider doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I remember reading another story on your blog about a, a similar one to that, but it was a, it was a ring, like a golden ring. And then when the person didn't pay the money back, the 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 loaner the person that lent the money went to get i guess it appraised or they wanted to sell the ring or something and then they t found out that the ring was actually a fake gold ring it wasn't yeah. it wasn't actual gold and so yeah. they kind of had this whole time they thought oh yeah well this ring is clearly worth as much as the money i'm lending to this person turns out it's a complete fake and uh and now they're left with this ring that's barely worth that's worth very very little compared to what they actually lend the person so that's kind of another uh, yeah, so that's an interesting thing to be watchful of as well. Um, or I guess if someone says, well, yeah, you can have, I don't know, my motorcycle or something as collateral or whatever. And if you don't actually have like, like a good binding contract and that piece, that asset is like is at their house. Well, if they stop paying you and you say, well, I want to claim the collateral because you've clearly defaulted on your loan. Well, what if they move somewhere and you never hear from them again? Or, you know, what, right. what are you going to do now? You're going to hire a lawyer and take him to court for it and then spend all this money on a lawyer, right? So so that's kind of, you know, you get into this sort of difficult situation that way too. Um, so I guess with collateral, the a good rule would be that you actually get to keep the thing that they're issuing as collateral uh, in your house so that, and you make sure that it's actually of value and that it's a fair arrangement, Right. Right. And the other thing um, you could do instead of have them giving you a thing, because maybe they don't have things right. uh, that are of value, they could give you um, a service. Maybe they're going to mow your lawn once a week during the whole during the whole term. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that might only be good for a certain <laughs> period of time, but yeah. at least, you know, you've gotten a, a service that's of some value to you. And it incentivizes uh, them to pay the loan off quickly because they're after the first right. week, they're probably sick of mowing your lawn already. And they're yeah. like, all right, I better pay this thing off because this is right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But then I guess the danger is that they could all of a sudden stop mowing your lawn. And then yeah. you're like, hey, what's going on, right? And then they yeah. just, so they're, they're all of a sudden difficult to get a hold of. <laughs> yeah. And they stop returning your calls. Yeah. And uh, and then now you're in a tough spot. So I guess, yeah, yeah, I guess the lesson here is you have to be really careful how you how you plan all of this out. Um, and then like the collateral is a good idea, but you have to be really careful about how you do it as well. Um, and I can see that being a tough discussion to have with someone as well, right? Like if it's a family member, they're going to be like, well, you, like, what do you like what do you want this is kind of i don't know I, I can see that not you have to delicately bring up the collateral thing as well right like maybe if you say well look you're asking me for a fair amount of money i want something in case something goes wrong on your end like you lose your job and all of a sudden you're not able to pay me back anymore right like, i guess you could word it like that perhaps i don't know right yeah or uh, maybe in the lawn mowing thing instead of you know saying well this is collateral saying okay well we're making we're making a trade here. I'm giving you the money, but also um, you're, you're you're giving me something in return in addition to the money. So that might kind of help soften it. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and shovel the snow in the in the winter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you live in a climate where both ser <laughs> both services are necessary. Yeah, and you know what? That's an interesting point. I mean, you brought up the whole lawn mowing thing. Well, yeah, maybe if if, if you're if you want the person to do something like that, then maybe you just hire them, right? As a, as a contractor. So instead of you lending them the money and having that service as kind of a collateral sort of like a variation of collateral, instead you say, look, I'll hire you, you, and I'll like pay you whatever. So they mow your lawn and then you pay them. And the next thing they mow your lawn and you pay them. And so you're basically giving them like a mini job <laughs> to give them the money. Uh, like I, I could see this being good. Maybe if you have um, like, let's say you have a younger sibling that needs money, right? And they're and they're maybe they're having trouble getting a job or they want to earn some extra money on the side. Well, you can basically get them to do these things if they want, and you basically pay them for it. And so it's kind of a variation as opposed to going and taking doing that whole loan approach, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So th so that might work. I I could, I could see that being uh something worth considering, perhaps. Um, okay. No, that sounds good. Um, now we we hear stories too about couples getting married. And then one of the partners finds out later that one of them is actually in very severe debt. 
So before you get, and then you know, now they have to deal with it, and now you know it becomes this whole issue in the marriage right from the get go. Like they just got married; they're supposed to be in their honeymoon phase, but all of a sudden that's kind of getting ruined because there's all these bills piling up, and this person feels like they've been, like they should have known about this before getting married. So how do you approach that subject with your loved one before you get engaged or married? Because it's a, it's a pretty delicate subject, right? Right. It is. Um, and it's one of the things you're going to have discuss money. One of the things you're going to have discussions about during your entire, uh, marriage or, or partnership or relationship. So mm -hmm. you have to be able to talk about it before if you're going to talk about it after. Um, so right. in, in the book, I actually have a you know, page. I don't know, this is like five pages of questions that, that you should ask. And I don't say that like, you sit down and go through everyone all in the same session. You like you, you put the light in their face, like the uh, yeah. like the interrogation, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the dark room, with the, like this, you know, the CIA right. interrogation. <laughs> yeah, totally. you know, Make it extra dramatic. Child support. You know, <laughs> Are you paying? It? So nothing that. like that. Maybe something no, no. on the backyard with a cocktail or something, and then you, yeah. you bring it yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I think um, from a sort of uh, robotic approach, as you were saying, you start off with the credit reports and you have to share yours too. It's a, it's a two way street mm -hmm. uh, because the credit report is going to show a lot of information. It's going to show the outstanding debt and, and the payment history. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that it doesn't show, but at least it's kind of one way to, to start out because um, you can't hide anything in there. Right. And unless there's some kind of mistakes, uh, it gives you the picture. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole lot of other questions and some of them aren't the, you know, pointing the finger, you know, why did you do this? Um, um, you know, why didn't you pay your bills on time? Why do you have all this debt kind of questions? But they're sort of more about attitudes. Um, so yeah, have a few glasses of wine and say, so what were your, in your upbringing, um, what was, uh, what were, what were the messages about money that you got growing up? Did your family, um, have a lot did they didn't did they have um, not so much how was money discussed and treated was it something uh, that was important above all else uh, that, or did you mm -hmm. grow up um, in a way that material uh, things were not so important uh, was not openly mm -hmm. or was it a hush hush thing um, do you know how much uh, your parents earned mm -hmm. as a salary you know so there's a whole because how we felt about uh, money growing up, I think really shapes how we feel about it in the future. And it's not necessarily that yeah. it's going to how it was dealt with um, when you were growing up is how you're going to deal with it as an adult, because it could actually be um, the, the opposite. But um, it's a good place to start is is knowing where, where someone's coming from. Um, and my one of my mm -hmm. uh, sort of favorite examples in, in the book was a, a, a TV ad I saw a long time ago where um, a man had just bought a house, his first house, and he opened up the front door um, and his attitude was, uh, you know, dad, it's, it's my house now. I can let all the heat out the front door if I want. <laughs> no, because oh, okay. his father always said, don't leave the front door <laughs> yeah. open. The, the heat will get out, which is you know, reasonable yeah. and all. But um, it was sort of his way of saying, um, you know, I can do what I want now. I can pay the heating bill. I can let all the heat out the front door if I want to. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you know what? And that's kind of a conversation that you should probably have anyway, if you're ever thinking of having kids as well. Right. Because um, because instead of just kind of out of the blue, all of a sudden asking them about like, let's say you're you're, you're engaged. Yeah. Right. And you're about to get married. Um, then you should probably talk about kids at that point, too. Right. You know, and, and how you would see raising them and, and how you'd like to do things or, you know, or if you even want kids at all. Um, but I mean, you know, when you're having that conversation, that's probably, I would think, a good time to bring up some of those questions, right? Because it's like, well, how, how, you know, how are you, what are your attitudes on money? Just so that when we're raising our, our child, we are sort of saying, you know, we're, we're on board, we're on the same page, as opposed to you saying one thing, me saying another, you know, how do you see that? So I could see that being kind of like a gentle way to approach the subject, to get your partner's 
uh, perspective on money and kind of their money mindset uh, without making it sound like some aggressive confrontational, <laughs> you know, CIA interrogation kind of thing. Right. And it's not like you're, yeah. and you're not like tricking them in time of the conversation. Like it, you genuinely do want to know this because you do want to make sure you're on board with, with children, right? Like, how do you feel about that? Like, I would want to know how my wife feels about that. So that when my daughter, when she's older, asks about that, you know, she gets the right answer, right? Um, or is fully aware. So I think that's kind of a, a good conversation to have anyway, right? Um, regarding, you know, children and, and things of that nature. Or like, look, we're going to be sharing our finances anyway. So like, maybe we should figure out our attitudes about money and how we feel about that just so that we just as a preventive measure so we don't get into like arguments later as we get older uh, as, as we're married so i think that's kind of a, a good way of approaching it too right as like a pre if you explain it as a that it's a preventative thing um as opposed to just look i don't trust you <laughs> i uh yeah. let's 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 go over your credit report with in extreme detail <laughs> right yeah. now that's absolutely critical and i think you had to have had those conversations before um, before you, you got engaged, yeah. uh, cause you, you do need to know where, where somebody wants to go in life. Uh, do mm -hmm. they do want to have kids and, and it's intertwined with, with money. You have to think about everything from, well, are we going to give allowances to our kids right, and right. the other end, are we going to want to send them to college? Are they going to, yeah, yeah. uh, are they going to go to a state school? Are they going to go to, are we going to pay for a private? Are we going to pay for it? Are we going to take out loans? Are they going to take mm -hmm. out loans? But you got to keep in mind that you have to be flexible because if you have young kids, you're talking about something that could be 15, 20 years down the track and mm -hmm. who knows what higher education is going to look like. Right. Uh, at, at that point, um, you know, I know somebody who just had their first baby and uh, he's freaking out because he's done the calculations and it's going to cost, he's saying it's going to cost $600,000 uh, oh. to send her to college. And I'm like, well, um, 529 savings, good idea. But just uh, um, you know, keep in mind, you, you, you do have to be flexible over time because you're um, your goals, priorities, and just economic reality is going to change. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. You have to have um, those conversations um, up front. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it's sort of interesting because there's always the question of, well, how early do you bring that up? I mean, there's the school of thought that, mm -hmm. okay, on the first date, you say, okay, do you want kids or not? And some people are like, you know, why are you getting into um, such important right. things on a first date when you're having lunch? But on That's, the other yeah. hand, if, if, if having kids or not having them is a deal killer for somebody, maybe do bring it up. So there's a, mm -hmm. a, a lot of debate um, between people how, how soon you bring up these uh, very important questions about finances and kids. And of course, there, there's no one right answer. You know, there's no, okay, at the one month mark, you right. ask X. Um, you know, you just sort of have to figure it out as you go along, but not wait till too late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. And you know what? The other thing, too, is that I mean, you mentioned the credit report and pulling it for the both of you. That's something that you should be doing annually anyway as a best practice. I don't know about because you're in the U.S., but I know here in Canada, you're able to pull it for free um, once a year uh, just to see if everything is correct. Right. And you're as a kind of personal finance best practice, you're supposed to do that just to make sure that something isn't on there that shouldn't be on there, right? Because that can affect your, you know, your credit rating and all that. So that's kind of another thing. It's is that, you know, with your partner, you could say, well, look, you know, I, I want to start pulling our credit reports annually just to make sure that there are no sort of blemishes on there that we, that are, that are wrong because, you know, you hear all the time about there being sort of mistakes on the credit report and then you have to get them resolved. Um, so that's kind of another way of, kind of getting, I guess, to your partner's credit report, <laughs> you know, bec uh, because, you, you know, you're sort of doing this annual audit anyway. And since you're doing it anyway, you'll see also if they do have some sort of massive debt or, or any sort of issues that you should be aware of. So you kind of get that information now as a byproduct of basically just following a, a best practice when it comes to credit and then credit reports. All right. And in the U.S., there's three credit bureaus, so you can sort of stagger them. You don't have to get all three mm -hmm. once a year. You can get one and then get the other one three months later. And, you know, so you're on a cycle. So you don't you can get it more. You can get the information more frequently than once a year. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're you're right. That's a part of your 
your checks and balances. Exactly, right? Like you do your taxes once a year and once a year you should also be pulling your credit report, you know, for and even if you're by yourself, right, you should still be pulling it just for just for that reason alone to to make to check it. So um and then yeah, you mentioned the whole you know, we're talking about before getting married and sort of the, asking these questions and getting into these conversations. One thing that worked out really well for us is we actually did a marriage kind of counseling sort of thing before we even got married just to it was almost like a, like a marriage prep actually it was a marriage prep course is what it was um and i thought that was really useful as well and there's even if you don't want to do a whole course there's even books on it i remember we bought a few books online that were things like questions you should ask each other before you get married and it's just this list of all these questions and i thought that was really neat like it worked out really well right because it kind of it's hard to know everything you should ask your partner before you get married. So you just sit down like once a week or, you know, over dinner or wine or whatever. And you start kind of going over these um, just to make sure that you're both fully aware, um, like in terms of your values and your finances and all these other things. I guess not just money related, right? It's values too. And kind of, you know, like the children's subject obviously comes up because if one person wants 10 kids and the other one doesn't want any that, you know, that should probably come up before you get married. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, minor detail. So, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> right. So I don't, I thought, I mean, for anybody that's kind of in that boat, I'd recommend, you know, doing that. And if you don't want to do a whole course, do a, like there's even a test that we actually did too. It was kind of neat. It was a, like an actual test where you each, fill out this questionnaire individually and then they sort of tabulate the results swap. and then they tell you well like you, i guess you swap but then there's, they also had like a they would flag certain things that we should definitely discuss because there is a big mismatch there so it's kind of a, it was a way to prioritize issues that things that might become issues in the future uh, that are kind of like taking time bombs that like look you should really discuss these now because it's going to only get harder later um, so that's kind of another thing I, I think you know and obviously finances is, is a big part of that so that's kind of another way that you can prepare so yeah that sounds like a terrific method yeah yeah so i know it worked out well for us we're, we're still happily married so. <laughs> how, ma how many years now? uh over five years now oh that's yeah, great yeah 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 so it's good and then and then yeah we just had our our, our first baby as well so she's she, oh congrats yeah, i think she's pretty awesome <laughs> yeah she's walking now so it's really like she's, she's getting into walking which is really fun um yeah. but anyways i'm gonna I, I don't want to be one of those people that talk about their kids all the time so i i won't i won't i won't digress in that area <laughs> unless we have some baby episode down the road about how to raise financially smart kids or something like that yeah that's a whole other topic, exactly right? exactly so that's something that i'll be learning in, in the, about in the future for sure um um, so that's all the questions that I had. I, thanks so much for sharing your experience and, and some of these the, the interviews you've had with the different people. Can you tell us a little bit more about your book? Uh, I'm excited to hear that you have a sequel coming out as well. I know your first book's done really well, so I, I mean, I'm not surprised you're doing a sequel. Um, yeah, it, it's awesome. I think it's a really good um, thing to read as like a preventative preventive guide, <laughs> you know, to, to make sure that we don't make some catastrophic mistakes. Um, and like you said, if you did fall into one of these mistakes, it can help you uh, sort of get work your way out of them as well, based on some of these lessons that others have learned. Um, so yeah, maybe tell us a bit more about your book uh, and then also your site. Okay. Uh, well, the book is Gold Diggers and Deadbeats Dads, True Stories of Friends, Family, and Financial Ruin. Um, it's the cradle to grave approach, as I said, for, um, people in their twenties through, um, uh, through the elderly, all the kinds of things, uh, that can come up, uh, during your life. It's based on true stories of people, um, who share their stories with me. Um, and it's available Amazon, um, uh, Barnes and Noble for Nook, um, all the usual outlets. Um, I, wrote it thinking okay i'll write this i'll get it done i'll go on and, and you know learn how to play guitar or something <laughs> um, but i started getting just tons of emails from people who had seen the blog um seen the book um, people who write and just share their their stories sometimes in, in great detail so um, I thought uh, maybe there's a there's another book in this. Yeah. Plus, I'm doing follow ups with a lot of the people who shared their oh, stories originally. That's great. And first time, yeah, I thought, oh, nobody will be interested in that. They figured it was a one time thing, and everybody who I've asked um, is more than willing to mm -hmm. to share the follow up. So that's great. Um, yeah, so that's exciting if you, as well. If you make these suggestions, or they tell you your story, and then maybe you make some suggestions to them, or they read your book and they learn some, some lessons, then yeah, like a follow-up sounds genius because then 
you can say, well, you know, so out of those things, you know, how did, how did you sort of dig yourself out of this hole? What worked out well? What didn't so that others can benefit too? I mean, that sounds really, really like extremely valuable information for sure. Right. And there's one with a, you know, very, very happy ending. That's good. Um, so, so it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> <That's good>. so. <laughs> so buy the sequel, <laughs> if for no other reason than to, you know, there's a real feel good uh, story in there. You'll, you'll have to get uh, more and more expertise on being a comedian too, right? Just so that when you have this really <laughs> sad story that we're trying to learn from, you can throw in some comic relief here and there. Just, just to keep the, <laughs> just so that you know I, I, people can laugh a little bit too. So it's not all doom and gloom. But, uh, but it's 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 like tough subjects, right? But it's something we have to, we really should learn from, right? Like, uh, you know, we were talking kind of about the the death and the comas and you know and the you know do not resuscitates and all these things. And it's something you don't really want to talk about. But I mean, these are sort of these life changing things that happen to many people at one point or another in their lives. So it as convenient as it is to just kind of turn the other way and not think about them and not deal with them. And um, that can make that pain that much worse when it actually happens to you. Right. So I think it's really good to sort of suck it up and just look, let's learn from this. Let's kind of, you know, let's do the band aid approach, just tear it off and let's just learn this uh, so that we can, we can kind of protect ourselves accordingly. All right. And it's, it's not easy. I, you know, we're talking about it like, uh, like these things are easy right. and I'll be first to admit, uh, not difficult, but critical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'm, I'm sure like with the follow-ups too, you can kind of, you'll have all these best practices as well and what worked well, what didn't, uh, to help people get out of these tough spots even quicker than if they were just to try to do it themselves all alone and just kind of, you know, struggling with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, yeah, because I could see that being extremely difficult for sure. Yeah. Um, so awesome. Well, well, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with it. And uh, and yeah, I, I look forward to seeing you. Uh, I, are you going to FinCon this year? Oh, I certainly okay. am. So we'll be able to meet in person after all this time. That'll be great. Sounds great. I look forward to it. Me too. Right. Thanks, thanks Valerie. for now. Have a great weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right, I hope you enjoyed the interview with Valerie and you can get all the links and resources mentioned in this episode over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash 21. Also, don't forget to send me your questions to be automatically entered into the draw to win a copy of Valerie's book. All right, while you're there, don't forget to join the Build Wealth Canada community by signing up for free to get exclusive guides and content that is only available to Build Wealth Canada subscribers, all right? Also, as a subscriber, you'll be the first to know of any giveaways that we'll continue to have where you can win great prizes from the many experts that we have on the show, all right? Have a great week and talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca.